I get the privilege this week of uh, not only talking about change, and specifically baptism as sort of a, an aspect of change, but um, also just sort of putting a bow on, on the entirety of uh, this little series, which I'm, uh, I'm, I'm incredibly excited to do. I think it's been um, just a, uh, an important and, and fascinating look into what we get to do here um, at, at church as, as uh, sort of part of the, the church service. It's been really valuable for me to look at these different aspects of the, uh, of the service together. So like I said, I get to talk about baptism today. And we're back on track. We have notes again, um, which is good for you guys. So we get to talk about baptism today. Baptism is uh, something that, with very, very few exceptions, all Christians around the world have been doing since Christ. Um, it's a, a, a pretty ubiquitous uh, Christian, everybody does it. It's, it's a very uh, common, common Christian ritual. In fact, it's one of the first, it's one of the two, um, at least, primary sacraments that we have. But it didn't begin with Christianity. In fact, uh, it, it has Jewish roots. And actually, probably if you trace it back further than that, it sort of comes from a, a, at least the general mindset of the, of the Near Eastern people. But um, it, it shows up first in our scriptures in the form of Jewish purification rituals. The Jewish people had lots and lots of laws, many of which rendered you uh, ritually unclean. You were, you were ritually unpure, and you, so you were not allowed to enter into the temple and to perform sacrifices. And so in order to sort of combat that, in order to uh, get around that, they would wash themselves. They would ritually purify themselves in order to bring themselves, uh, allow themselves into, into God's presence. Um, hopefully, the idea behind that being much more than simply the, the washing of the water, like Peter says, not the washing of the water, uh, not, not the washing of the body with the water. Um, it's, it's preparing yourself with a clean heart. It is bringing yourself with a clean heart into God's presence. So it began first with uh, Jewish purification rituals. Then, a little bit later on in Jewish history, the, the, exil, the exile comes, the Babylonian exile comes, the Jewish people get uh, taken off to Babylon. And then by the time they come back, this, this uh, baptism ritual has sort of changed tenor a little bit, and it has become a way to bring non-Jewish people into the Jewish community. So uh, non-Jewish people who are wanting to become part of the Jewish community would get baptized, and they would become, uh, they would become Jewish people. Not too terribly long after that, um, uh, John the Baptist comes. And he picks up on this ritual and he sort of combines these ideas of, of uh, purifying your heart before God and entering into the Jewish community. And he begins baptizing people in the Jordan River to prepare them for the Messiah as a symbol of the renewal of a covenant. So they are, they are uh, the Jewish people being baptized are renewing the covenant they have with God, re-purifying themselves in preparation for the Messiah coming. Finally, sort of the final process of this evolution um, Jesus himself was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, as our example. And uh, then he was raised out of that and began his ministry. And as part of his ministry, his disciples, uh, not himself as far as we can tell from Scripture, but at least his disciples, baptized other people. So Jesus uh, taught his disciples to baptize. And in fact, um, the very end of our Gospels, the, at least the Gospel of Matthew, ends with the Great Commission, where Jesus tells, us to, to, tells his disciples specifically, but us in general, to go out baptizing everyone in the name of uh, all nations in the name of the Lord. So that was the, sort of the, the evolution, the beginning of this great Christian ritual that we've been doing uh, effectively ever since. Again, with very, very few exceptions, we uh, all, all as Christians continue baptizing people to this day. But ultimately, the question of this sermon, I think um, the, the question of this series is why? why? Why is that important? We're not ritually purifying ourselves. That's, that's not really the problem. We don't baptize ourselves over and over again to continue being able to come into God's presence. We're not simply renewing a covenant that already exists, uh, already exists, and we're certainly not being brought into the Jewish community. So what exactly is baptism doing? I, I have uh, been thinking about this a, a good deal as I was thinking about specifically baptism, and I think baptism lays out a good pattern for what that purpose looks like, what the, the purpose of liturgy in general looks like. So this is what I came up with. 
in, uh, in baptism specifically, but in all liturgy in general. We are called by Christ together to put to death the old self, to be transformed into new life, and to, send, and to be sent into the world to be Christ. I think that is the pattern of, of, of uh, liturgy that baptism lays out. And in fact, I think uh, you can clearly see the, the, I think the value of this particular pattern when you compare it to the church service as a whole. Baptism as this example, as the beginning sort of, a, of the covenant relationship with God, um, it is the, the beginning, the foundation of this pattern, of this pattern of being called together to be changed and to, to be like Christ in the world. So I'd like to demonstrate that for you, if that's all right. First off, called by Christ. Baptism is a, a, a ritual that was instituted by Christ himself. We didn't come up with baptism. We didn't decide to do it uh, randomly. It wasn't a, a later invention of, of church fathers or people even further down the line. It uh, was instituted by Christ himself. So we, we baptize not simply because we like to, though I think it's inherently, I, th I think there's some, some serious value there. And I think if you are baptized, you should want to, you should desire to be baptized. But we do it first because Christ called us to be baptized. We are asked to be baptized. Um, the, the disciples were told to go out into all the world. It says, in fact, Matthew uh, 28, 19, so I don't misquote. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So this, this ritual was instituted first by Christ, and, and so we do it in response to his call, uh, a response to his call to be in, in covenant relationship with him. Likewise, the church service is, uh, is not something we invented either. Jesus first called a group of people to himself. Church is a response, ultimately, to, to Christ's call. In fact, I think uh, John, John 1.43 is a, is a great example of this pattern. It says, The next day, Jesus decided to leave for Galilee. He found Philip and told him, Follow me. John 1, in, in its entirety, sort of lays out that pattern uh, consistently. Over and over again, Jesus meets people, or he goes and finds people, and he says, follow me, and they follow him. And thus begins the, the, the very beginning of what the church is. So the first thing that I think that liturgy teaches us is that God loves us and desires a, an intimate relationship with us. I think that's the, the, the first purpose of what liturgy is, both in, in baptism and in the church service. Second, we are called, but we are not just called, we are called together. Baptism is not something that is, uh, is done alone. It, it, it involves at least one other person. Actually, I would argue it involves three people. You need yourself, God, the person you're uh, beginning this uh, covenant relationship with, and then a witness. We, we live in a, a a culture that's incredibly individualistic. I think it's something that's hard to recognize, especially because we're from here, um, but, but we don't tend to think of ourselves in groups very much. We tend to, to primarily think of ourselves first as individual people, and then secondly uh, as, as groups, if, if at all. And I think, there's, I think there's issues with that. It's not inherently wrong, but I think that uh, the, the people who wrote Scripture, the, the culture that that came out of, was very, very much communal, and they understood something about human beings that I think we can, um, I think we can miss if we don't recognize that we are supposed to be in community with each other. Third, we've been called by Christ together to put to death the old self and to be transformed into new life. I tried originally to split that up into two points in my notes, but I found it really difficult to talk about just one without the other. I think they're um, two sides of a coin. For example, baptism as a, as a symbol is, it sounds a little bit gruesome to say, I don't know if we think about it this much, uh, this way very often, but it is a, a symbolic death. It is, it is a representation of us dying. And then us being brought to life, a core part of what Christianity is, has fundamentally to do with the fact that we have died and that we have been raised again. In fact, um, Paul 
in the entirety of chapter 6 of Romans, lays this out very well. But just a, a little snippet of this, in verses 4 and 5, he says, Therefore, we were buried with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too may walk in the newness of life. For if we have been united with him in the likeness of his death, we will certainly also be in the likeness of his resurrection. So death as a picture is central to the Christian walk. And so is this new life. In fact, I think you can break uh, baptism down into roughly three parts. Before the water, the water itself, and after the water. First, before the water, we were living our lives, living our lives uh, apart from God, re rejecting God separate from him. We were living in sin, and that sin, the Scripture teaches us clearly the, the wages of sin is death. When sin has reached its fullness, uh, death is the result. So we were living in sin, which is ultimately living in a kind of death. I think we were walking around in a living hell of sorts, uh, a life that would play out in the ultimate destiny of eternal death. Yes. But in the water, we die, which is what... We wanted. That's what our bodies were doing. That's what our spirits were doing. We were living in sin. We were choosing death the whole time. We've given it over to death. It can die. That's what it wanted. But the good thing is we don't stay there, obviously. We're, we're brought out of the water. We, we become new people. The old has passed away. Uh, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and see, the new has come. We don't just stay in the water, we're brought out, and we're, we're brought out into new life, a life that lives apart from sin, in, in the spirit, continuing to live in life into a destiny that plays out into eternal life. In baptism, sort of the, the unspoken part of baptism, something that we don't think about or talk about all that much, is the fact that after you get baptized, you walk out of the water, and you dry off, and then you have to start living. Like, you have to start living life. And you have, to, you have to be transformed into something. We've been brought into new life, but that new life isn't just our own. In fact, we are being raised into the image of Christ. So this, this sort of last unspoken step of baptism is the rest of our entire lives, the, the process of being transformed not just into new life, but into the image of Christ. That is uh, a, a pattern that the New Testament lays out rather clearly, that our lives are not merely our own now. We are not merely raised to new life, to, to be these new creatures by ourselves, but to be shaped into uh, the image of Christ. The goal is for you to become little Christs, Christians, that's what the word means, uh, little representations of who Christ is. In fact, I really like the way Michael put it last week, that our, our goal as Christian people is to be infected and then infectious with this viral depiction of who Jesus is, to go out into the world as viral representations of Christ, to change our, our houses and our workplaces and our communities and our towns and our world through representing Christ. And a necessary part of that is letting go of ourselves. We must sacrifice our old self in order to become something new. But the beautiful thing about this is that we don't, we don't merely lose ourselves in that process. I think that's an important thing to note. It can, be, it can sound scary and uncomfortable that we must become Christ. We must become this, this new person. But we don't just lose ourselves. When we are transformed, like this revealing of this, of this diamond, we are more ourselves. We are more of that image than ever. Christ is this perfect representation, and we are this, uh, this equally beautiful diamond. We are living fully into the image of God that we have been created in. The church service, similarly, helps participate in this change. The church service is commissional in nature. That's the, the, the word that I was looking for. He, uh, when he called his disciples to make, make disciples of all nations, to baptize people and make disciples of all nations, he sent them out. That was a, that was a commission. That was his great uh, and final command. Part of that commission is that same process, to go out into the world as Christ. In church, we have 
uh, generally what is called a, a benediction. It just means good word, but it is a word generally at the end of a service, a dismissal, anything from a, a long and elegant prayer or some written phrase to go in peace. But the, hopefully the idea behind it, the, the, the benediction is supposed to be saying, go and do. Go and do as you have heard. You have learned. You have been shaped and transformed over the course of the service. Now go into the world and do likewise. Be Christ in the rest of the world. That is part of what the church service is inherently teaching us to do to be changed, and then to be sent out into the world.